The incident that led to the death of Jim Waller, uh, Michael Nathan, Sandy Smith, Cesar Quance, and Bill Sampson has been called the Greensboro Massacre. The families of the victims sued the city of Greensboro, and in court proved that the Klansmen did not act alone. The head of the local Ku Klux Klan, who had led the caravan, was in fact an agent of the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco. The Greensboro Massacre was in fact carried out with close cooperation between the U.S. government and fascists. But the details of Miller's life get even more interesting in the 1990s. It has been revealed that, that Miller was part of the Federal Witness Protection Program, the reasons for this being undisclosed. While he was a part of this program, thousands of dollars were paid to him and his family, and the FBI helped him to legally change his name without any public record. The facts are that prior to the killing spree in Kansas, Miller had an entire career as a violent Nazi that was closely supported by the U.S. Department of Justice. But Miller is not alone. Radio host Hal Turner, who was considered to be the most well-known neo-Nazi radio host in the U.S., received over $4 million from the FBI. They financed his hate-filled radio program, where he even threatened the life of sitting Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. In prisons across the U.S., the Aryan Brotherhood functions as a criminal association of white prisoners. The group uses swastikas as well as the Ku Klux Klan's Celtic Cross. Though it only accounts for 0.01% of prisoners, according to the FBI's own report, 20% of prison murders are carried out by the Aryan Brotherhood, according to the FBI's report. And in my work as a prison solidarity activist in Ohio, prisoners would often describe to me how the Aryan Brotherhood, quote, does the dirty work of the guards, beating up and sometimes killing inmates who the guards want to don't, don't approve of or something. The reality is that the U.S. government, specifically the military and policing agencies, have an unspoken, unstable, and widely unacknowledged relationship with fascists and neo-Nazis. This relationship is nothing new. The Ku Klux Klan has almost always functioned as a government-sponsored organization. It was created by the dispossessed slave owners in the U.S. South after the Civil War to attack recently freed slaves and members of the Republican Party who were pushing for greater measures of social equality. The Klan was revived in 1915 by Thomas Dixon, the close friend of President Woodrow Wilson. Dixon wrote a book that was eventually turned into the first full-length movie ever made, The Birth of a Nation. This Hollywood film was screened all across the U.S., and in several instances after the movie was shown, audience members were so filled with racist hate that they would go and lynch random African Americans that they found after seeing the movie. But the U.S. government's relation with fascism goes beyond the Ku Klux Klan. It was revealed in 1934 that the still-existing veterans organization, they're still around, the American Legion, was working closely with fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. The American Legion and a number of U.S. Army and Marine Corps generals were actually plotting a coup d'etat against then-President Roosevelt, hoping to transform the U.S. into a fascist dictatorship. And the relationship goes on even after the Second World War. George Lincoln Rockwell, who founded the American Nazi Party, made hundreds of thousands of dollars from speaking engagements at public universities. Though communist leaders such as Gus Hall were often banned from speaking at public universities, George Lincoln Rockwell was often paid thousands of dollars for a single lecture. He would get up at these lectures and deny the Holocaust, call for the atomic bombs to be dropped on China, attack the civil rights movement, use racial and ethnic slurs, and the university would pay him and then say what, having him speak was a great example of academic freedom and diversity of opinion. The reason that fascism has so much support from the circles of power within the United States is due to the fact that fascism is very useful to the billionaire class. The capitalists who own and control the economy. Fascism is a necessary part of all capitalist societies. As working people, those of us who don't own banks, factories, and industries, but instead sell our labor to survive, as we organize and demand better wages and working conditions and an end to racism and repression, it becomes necessary to use violence and terror to beat us back. Usually this can be done with the police, like what happened at Occupy Wall Street. However, in some cases, it's necessary to create a right-wing mass movement to ensure that the billionaires keep their power and get their way. Recent events in Ukraine are a textbook example of fascism carrying out its normal function under capitalism. The elected government of Yanukovych refused to join the European Union. They refused to sign on to the IMF loans and accept the domination by bankers on Wall Street, the London Stock Exchange, the wealthy firms in Frankfurt and Berlin. Because the elected government would not obey the bankers, a fascist movement was created to overturn the elected government. With violence and terror, groups like the Right Sector, Fatherland, Svoboda took control. In one tragic episode during the original fascist riots of the Euro Maiden events, uh, some leftists from the Ukraine, uh, some, from, some Trotskyists, I guess you could call them, uh, attempted to join these ultra-right-wing protests and were actually beaten up and kicked out by the fascists. They didn't want any left-wing people to have anything to do with it. 
Now, now that the Nazis burned and kicked and bombed and tortured their way into control of the Ukrainian government, they're doing what fascists usually do. The Communist Party is being repressed, trade unions are being repressed, books are being burned, ethnic and religious minorities, specifically Jews and Russians, are being attacked. But in addition, the bankers are getting their way. Privatizations are being carried out. Food and fuel subsidies are being eliminated. The old age pension has been cut by 50%. 50% is the old age, I mean, that's, that's amazing. But the story doesn't end there. The people of Ukraine, especially in the eastern and southern regions, have refused to surrender. In Donetsk and Lugansk, the people have voted for independence and for the new government. They have created people's republics. In Ukraine, currently a state of dual power exists. The Communist Party, the Progressive Socialist Party, and a dynamic revolutionary youth group called Barotva, which is the Russian word for struggle, uh, are fighting back. Now, John Kerry and the U.S. media officials are often dismissing these revolts as merely the actions of, of Russian agents. These are all just stooges of Putin, people paid off. Well, they're wrong. Anyone who is at all familiar with the history of the Ukraine can easily understand why these revolts, led by communists, have so much massive support. Ukraine was once a socialist republic, part of the Soviet Union. Prior to 1917, most Ukrainians were illiterate. Thousands died annually of starvation and malnutrition-related diseases. Now, one of the first projects the Communist Party carried out after the revolution was, was a mass literacy campaign. In 1928, the Soviet Union launched the five-year plans and rapidly, rapidly industrialized the country. During this period, Ukraine had become, became home to actually what was the world's largest hydroelectric power plant, the Dnieper Dam. The famous Dnieper Dam was studied by electrical engineers from all across the world, and it was considered a huge feat of scientific innovation. Running water and electricity became available to Ukrainian people for the first time in their history. Tatiana Fedorova, a woman who worked at the Dnieper Dam, was interviewed by PBS in 1995 about her experiences during the period of socialist construction in the Ukraine. This is what she said, and these are her words, not mine. She said, this was a country where people wore birch bark shoes, lived in virtual darkness, and were illiterate. Even now, I think it's like something out of a fairy tale. How is it possible in such hostile circumstances to raise these great construction sites? It was only possible through the unity of the people and the love of the people for their idol, Comrade Joseph Stalin. Donetsk, a city which is at the center of the anti-fascist of the anti revolt, had never had a sewer system prior to the revolution of 1917. It was in 1931 that the Communist Party mobilized the population to build the sewer system. Prior to 1917, the people in Donetsk were mostly illiterate, but by 1965, Donetsk became the site of the Soviet Union's Academy of, Science, of Sciences, and people from all over the world were going to Donetsk to study the most advanced developments in scientific research. In 1970, the United, excuse me, <clears throat> the United Nations Economic, Social, and Cultural Organization declared Donetsk to be the, quote, the cleanest industrial city on earth. The restoration of capitalism in 1991 brought huge disaster for the people of the Ukraine. In Soviet Ukraine, there was no unemployment. Every person had a job and was part of the economy. But now the official rate of unemployment in Ukraine is 8.9%, according to the CIA World Factbook, with the rate of underemployment and registered underemployment actually much higher. The Soviet Union had the highest rate of doctors and hospital beds per capita of any country on Earth. Now, according to the Kiev Post, there's, quote, Ukraine is, quote, 50,000 doctors short, and the healthcare system is crumbling due to a lack of funding and deterioration. That's from the Kiev Post, which is actually supporting these fascist movements, even they admit how bad things have gotten. Ukrainian women had two years paid maternity leave in the Soviet Union, as well as free access to birth control and abortion. Now many Ukrainian women have become victims of sex trafficking. That's one of the, the great wonders of the free market that's been brought in by capitalism. It is heresy in modern academia or media to say anything, to, to point it out, but in Ukraine, just like everywhere else, the people were mar much better off under socialist rule. The planned economy that existed in the USSR was not a big failure by any means. It greatly benefited the people of the Ukraine, and when it was overturned in 1991, things got far worse. Now in Ukraine, communists are leading the heroic anti-fascist revolt. But let's be clear, the bulk of the workers who are participating in the revolt are not conscious communists, though they may have nostalgia for the Soviet period. But this has been true in every revolution. Marxism-Leninism, unlike utopian socialism, is scientific. It sees socialism as arising as a product of contradictions within capitalist society. Workers in Ukraine are not fighting and dying because the Communist Party convinced them the benefits of creating a socialist Ukraine. They are fighting because they hate fascism, and the Communists, with their scientific understanding and their record going all the way back to World War II and before, are proven as effective leaders in the fight against fascism. The reason that the situation in Ukraine is so vitally important to working people in the United States and all throughout the world is because Ukrainian workers are facing the same crisis we face. Capitalism has collapsed economically. 
Technology has become so efficient that there's no room for millions of workers. With so few workers earning, earning wages in, modern, in the modern computer high-tech economy, products cannot be sold. What Marx wrote about in Capital, the problem of overproduction, has come true on a global scale. The only way out of the crisis that the capitalists can think of is fascism and war. And as workers fighting back, demanding their homes not be foreclosed, demanding that their food stamps not be cut, that their schools not be closed down, that their tuition not skyrocket, that their children not be sent to prison, that cops, cops not patrol the streets murdering people, as workers we begin to resist these hostile conditions created by the capitalists, by the billionaire class, and they are more likely to unleash these monsters, these fascists, that they have kept in their back pockets in case a moment like this arises. People like Glenn Miller, Hal Turner, and Svoboda are part of the fascist program for maintaining capitalist power. We must learn from the communists in the Ukraine about how we can be at the center of the battle against fascism and austerity, and perhaps someday we can create a People's Republic of New York City. Now, I want to end my talk. I want to end my talk with an anecdote. Now, during the 1930s, there was a social democratic writer who actually mocked the U.S. Communist Party, and he. he he was making fun of them, and he said, if you ask the average member of the U.S. Communist Party what it means to be against their party, they'll just say, we are really against fascism. And he was mocking this. He was saying that this, this meant somehow that the you members of the U.S. Communist Party were not familiar with politics, were, were just kind of repeating a line. But in reality, when, when members of the U.S. Communist Party said, we we're really against fascism, they were, they were very clear, and they were understanding their politics. To be truly against fascism, one must be opposed to the capitalist system and the wealthy 1% that spawns fascism in order to keep this system intact. During the Second World War, the Battle of Cable Street in London, in the fields of Spain, in China, and everywhere else, communists have proved that we're the ones who are really against fascism. The only way to end fascism once and for all is to overturn the global capitalist imperialist system and to create a society in which working people control the economy and human need, not capitalist profit, directs the economy. To be really against fascism, uh, excuse me here, to be really against fascism, you must be fighting for communist revolution.